Alas, the sequel to Breath of the Wild was once again a no-show at this year's Game Awards. But we did actually get some new info on the game, though not through conventional means like a trailer, teaser or update from the man himself, Eiji Aonuma, but instead a series of patents issued by the Nintendo Corporation regarding some of the new mechanics in the game. Now, some might be under the impression that these patents are brand new, but the actual application was done a while ago. They were made public on December 2, 2021. However, if you look at the date of demand, they were issued between May 24 and 26, which is about three weeks before the second teaser was dropped at E3. The mechanics featured in these patents include time reversal, passing or phasing through ceiling objects, and Link's new maneuverability while airborne. Each one of these mechanics was shown or at least hinted at in the 2021 teaser, which I'm sure is the reason why Nintendo applied for the patents right before the E3 presentation. Now of course, patents in video games are nothing new. In fact, as of 2020, Nintendo themselves have the highest number of active patents out of all major gaming companies. And we're not just talking about logos, names and characters either, but gameplay mechanics and hardware design too. For instance, Nintendo has long held a patent on the look of the D-pad, which expired in 2005. Up until 2012, corkscrew loops like the ones from Sonic the Hedgehog 2 were patented by Sega, which is why you didn't see them in other games at the time. Or Bandai Namco's claim on the training mode from Tekken, which has always been superior to contemporary fighting games, especially when it came to practicing timing and inputs. And there are many more examples where a specific type of game or hardware design is protected. Although sometimes considered controversial and in a few instances subject to petty abuse, in most cases patents are a necessary business tactic to protect certain ideas especially during the development stage. Imagine if another developer spots your idea in one of your trailers, then creates a game with that exact same mechanic and releases it before you do. That would be pretty bad. However, unlike other registered IP rights, like a copyright for instance, which only cost about 50 to 65 bucks, the application for a patent can be quite costly, ranging from $10,000 to $20,000 each. It's mostly reserved for big and wealthy corporations as opposed to small indie developers. Patents are also subject to rigorous examination before being approved. If an idea is too broad or something similar already exists, chances are it's gonna get rejected. Which is why I'm quite curious what these patents for Breath of the Wild 2 will mean for the gameplay as some of these don't exactly seem like the most novel concepts out there. Rewinding time? That's been done many times before. Passing through a wall, or in this case a ceiling? A bit more obscure, I guess, but I'm sure there's games out there that have done something like it. Same goes for controlling your character pose, orientation and camera position while skydiving. I've taken the effort to read through every text inside the patents devoted to the actual mechanics themselves, and translate it to more simple terms as the raw descriptions are overly technical, convoluted and incredibly repetitive. Trust me, it wasn't exactly an exciting read. And by by God do they love using the words non-limiting for some reason. Today we'll only be focusing on the time reversal mechanic. See how it works, the implications, restrictions, possibilities, etc. If I find anything interesting about the other two mechanics, I'll be making a separate video for those two. I will also be sketching some very simple gameplay examples, just for the fun of it. Though do keep in mind that these probably won't represent the actual final product. Even with all this info, we won't know exactly how it works until we finally see it in action. With that said, let's get started. As stated before, I will only be focusing on the actual description of the mechanic paired with the illustrations, which are elaborated on in the description as well. There's a lot of other information, but most of it isn't interesting to us. It's your typical legal stuff, like document numbers, dates of issue and publication, the cooperative patent classification, basically the category and subcategories the patent falls under, depositors, legal claims, receipts, attorney-related stuff, and so on. The mechanic in question is described as a return movement and was requested on May 24, 2021. The people credited as inventors include programmer Naoki Fukada, game designer Corey Bunnell, one of only a few Westerners actively working as a member of the Zelda dev team in Japan and who also worked on Breath of the Wild prior, and game slash level designer Yuya Sato. Like I said before, time manipulation and in particular rewinding is nothing new. There's a vast list of games that feature a mechanic to rewind time in some way, shape or form. A famous example being Prince of Persia The Sands of Time, which gives you the option to reverse the flow of time for a maximum of 10 seconds into the past and get a do-over in case you make a mistake. 
Link's the Time Sweeper on the original Xbox had the option to freeze, slow down or rewind time. And in a more recent example, Game of the Year winner It Takes Two, we also find a way to reverse time in specific scenarios. And there's much more where that came from. So what makes Breath of the Wild 2's rewind mechanic different? The introduction states that movement related parameters used in a virtual physical calculation are changed such that the designated object selected based on an operation input is caused to perform a return movement to return to previously recorded positions and orientations. In more simple terms it means that with a specific input the player can rewind time on selected physics objects and return it to a previous position in time. The same way stasis could freeze one object at a time in Breath of the Wild. Now in the games I mentioned earlier when you reverse the flow of time, either everything plays in reverse, including the player, or everything but the player does. But in Breath of the Wild 2 we can clearly see from the trailer that even though the entire screen turns black and white, the spike ball is the only thing moving back in time. The enemies, and presumably Link himself, continue to move as normal. Even this on its own isn't really all that groundbreaking. You can easily find tutorials online on how to do this kind of stuff in Unity or the Unreal Engine, rewinding objects to a previous state while the player character remains unaffected. It doesn't even require all that much coding either. However, I did find one interesting thing about Breath of the Wild 2's rewind mechanic that makes it stand out, and might be the reason why Nintendo patented the code. But before I get into that, I first need to explain how rewinding time on objects is generally achieved in video games. Whenever the player interacts with a physics object, the game executes a series of calculations to determine how that object should behave and where it should end up. In most cases, these calculations are based on real-life classical physics. Factors like the mass of the object, friction, gravity, velocity, angular velocity, the force enacted upon the object, things like that. So in order to play something in reverse, you'll need to somehow keep a record of where that object started in the virtual space, its previous trajectory, how long it took to get there, its orientation and other factors like acceleration and deceleration. In a video game there's only three types of data needed for this. The position data, orientation or rotation, and the time scale, which in video games is determined by frames. One way to do it is to record the object's position and rotation data for each individual frame inside of a buffer. Once you have that data stored, you then essentially reverse the array and play the animation in reverse frame by frame again when executing the rewind mechanic. Another way would be to only record data for specific frames, say every 10 frames, and then interpolate between them as you play it back. This is less heavy on the memory since you don't have to store as much data, but the downside is that the playback animation will be less accurate, since the system will have to estimate what happened between those recorded frames. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's a great talk at the GDC by the creator of Braid, a great indie game that also uses an elaborate rewind mechanic. According to the description, Breath of the Wild 2 will use the same technique of recording object data data frame by frame, and storing it in the dynamic random access memory, or DRAM for short which corresponds with the first technique of recording data frame by frame. However, in a later section it also states that it should be noted that the time intervals at which the position and orientation data are recorded may be other time intervals, e.g. one second instead of a frame, which is in line with the second technique of interpolation. I guess maybe at the time of application they hadn't made a definitive choice on which technique they will ultimately use. Or maybe they'll use both, I have no idea. Now, in the case of Prince of Persia, everything on screen gets played back. Basically, the entire world state is being buffered. But in Breath of the Wild 2, it'll only affect individual objects. Physics objects such as crates, barrels and more, which in the illustrations are indicated by the name Object M, will be selectable and then reversed, given that it has previously recorded position and orientation data. And it seems that this data isn't just recorded when Link himself interacts with said object, but also when moved by an outside force, as we can see with the spike ball rolling down the hill in the teaser, which was likely triggered by an enemy and not by Link, yet he's still able to reverse it. It also hints that the reversal can be cancelled at any moment by the player. Quote, the return movement of a designated object may be allowed to end halfway, in response to the user's operation of giving an instruction to cancel the return movement. Additionally, in the illustrations we see some sort of gauge, indicated by the letter G, which is mentioned here. Quote, in the case where the remaining time indicator, G, is displayed while a designated object is performing return movement, the processor causes the remaining time indicator to display the maximum remaining time at the start of the return movement. So yeah, as expected, it's a time indicator that shows how far back in time you can go and will count down as the action is performed. How long we'll be able to rewind and whether or not it's upgradable is not mentioned, though it does mention an example time of 20 seconds. The illustration also shows the character running as the gauge is on screen, indicating that indeed we will still have control over Link while the return movement is active. 
but where things get more interesting is the way these objects will behave when traveling backwards, and might be where it stands out from other games that use similar mechanics. The description states that, quote, it should be noted that when a designated object performing return movement collides with another object, or character, the state, existence, position, orientation or the like of at least one of the colliding objects may be changed. As an example, the state of at least one object may be changed, including disappearance due to damage or the like caused by the collision, or the position and orientation of at least one of the objects may be affected, depending on the movement parameters at the time of collision. In other games, when you rewind time, the object, or entire game in some instances, is simply moving backwards. With the exception of the player choices, everything else will play out the exact same way again after the rewind stops. While in reverse, there won't be a sudden collision of two objects where previously there was none, because all objects are repeating what they did when moving forward. However, in Breath of the Wild 2, according to the text and one of the diagrams, objects can actually receive new collision data while moving backwards. So, say for example you hit or throw a metal ball and it moves across the environment. Then you place another object in the path of its previous trajectory. Since that object wasn't there before, the ball cannot travel back in reverse the same way, as its path has been obstructed, meaning it'll collide with the other object on the way back. This will likely end the reverse motion and a new trajectory will be calculated based on the collision. To demonstrate the impact of this, I'll use It Takes Two as an example. Here we see a statue being smashed, which seems to use actual shatter physics. When you reverse time, it'll simply play that same animation in reverse, and that's it. And when you return the flow of time back to normal, the same thing will repeat. Every piece will end up in the exact same position once again, regardless if a piece interacts with the player model or any other factor. But with Breath of the Wild 2's rewind mechanic, even in reverse, factors like velocity, angular velocity, and the mass of the objects are still taken into account and used for new collision data. So even in reverse, new scenarios are allowed to take place, and things won't always simply repeat the exact same way. I have no idea how this works code-wise, but, well, that's why I make YouTube videos and are not in Japan working on Breath of the Wild 2 right now, like our man Cory over here. The diagram also shows that it takes into account the possibility of an object disappearing, which as the text explains refers to unloading, such as when breakable objects are destroyed. So if instead of a metal ball, it's a wooden barrel, the backwards collision will break the barrel causing it to unload. So yeah, it's pretty interesting to see what kind of crazy stuff we'll be able to pull off. And it's likely that Breath of the Wild 2 will be a physics playground once again, just like its predecessor. In terms of limitations, there's a couple of mentions of what it cannot do. One instance describes that the motion of an object can be reversed, but other factors like elemental effects cannot. Quote, an influence or the like exerted by the movement of the movable objects on other objects before the return movement cannot be subsequently cancelled. Here examples of transitional effects or changeable states of the movable objects include damage, burning, electricity, resistance, leakage, freezing and disappearance, depending on the material of the object. In the return movement, such transitionable states are not caused to return to a previous state. As a quick example, this means that if you throw a barrel away and then set it on fire, it will reverse the motion of the barrel, but it continues to burn, even though technically it has surpassed the point in time before you set fire to it. Same goes for other effects like freezing, electric currents, etc. Damage done to the object will also not be inverted or undone, and destroying it outright is also irreversible. Basically, the reversal mechanic only encompasses the object's position and rotation. Everything else will operate independently from it as normal. It remains to be seen what other limitations this mechanic will have. For example, it doesn't say at which point the recorded data for an object will be removed or overwritten. Does it also account for motion when carried? Can you only rewind the object that was last moved? or does it keep records of multiple objects at the same time, and you can rewind all of them? And if so, is there a limit to that amount? I'm guessing it all depends on how many types of objects can be rewinded and if they'll be able to compress the data somehow. So far there's mentions of circular cylinders, cones, truncated cones, discs, rings, barrels, or hollow cylinders, but also objects with other shapes. Breath of the Wild had a lot of physics objects. Not just balls, barrels, and boxes, but also weapons, resources like gemstones, snowballs, you name it. I'd imagine there has to be some sort of limit to it, as keeping track of the frame data for hundreds of individual physics objects would no doubt take up a lot of memory. The description also elaborates on the visual design of the mechanic, but it's overly long, way too complex for what it tries to say, and basically boils down to it's pretty much the exact same as in Breath of the Wild. You select the object with the cursor, it lights up and you activate the ability. 
The only unique visual to the mechanic is that the screen will apparently become black and white, that it displays a yellow line which indicates its previous trajectory, and those transparent clones of the object showing where it was at certain times in the past. But we already saw that in the teaser. So lastly, let's take a look at some gameplay examples. Obviously there's a lot of potential for combat, like we saw in the teaser, so let's focus on simple dungeon puzzles instead. Also in these examples, I will not take into account other Sheikah Slate abilities. If we did, these puzzles would be vain, but we don't know if they will make a return in the sequel. There's a room with a switch and two gates, one closed and one open. When the switch is held down, it'll trigger gate 1 to open. However, it also lowers gate 2, preventing you from moving to the next room. Inside the room is also a box. You take the box and place it on the switch. You then hit or throw the box away from the switch, causing gate 1 to close and gate 2 to open again. You then stand between the two gates, reverse time on the box so it moves back onto the switch, and you can move on to the next room. Or say you have a room with a cannon that repeatedly shoots a ball across the room. There's a switch which raises a pillar with another switch on the side, and back down again when you step off the switch. The goal is to make the ball hit the second switch, however it's on the other side of the pillar so the ball will never be able to hit it. And well, as you probably guessed, you need to step on the switch just as the ball passes it, target the ball and reverse it so it slams into the switch and the door will open or an item will appear or whatever. Again, very simple examples and I'm no level designer by any means. But given what we've seen from the shrines in Breath of the Wild, they can make it extremely smart and complex, with multiple objects, crazy physics, collisions, you name it. Not to mention that if the game has more interesting abilities like the Sheikah Slate did, which it likely will, you may need to use the time reversal in conjunction with other abilities or items, like I don't know, a hookshot or something. Additionally, since we'll be able to cancel the time reversal halfway as described, I can see even more possibilities for complex puzzles. And that covers all the interesting stuff I was able to find about the mechanic. A massive thanks to everyone who watches my videos, the people in my Discord community, and of course my Patreons and channel members. If you will, please give a warm welcome to Random Citizen and Mitch Elvey for joining, and to Lovelust Heart and Aaron for upgrading their pledge. As always, you are amazing and I cannot thank you enough. And that concludes the last video of the year. I want to thank each and every one of you for making 2021 another amazing endeavor. Enjoy the holidays, have a great end of the year celebration, and I will see you all in 2022. The year we might finally see Breath of the Wild 2 become a reality. Here's to that. This is Don signing off and have a good one.